Okay, well, the numbers are still going up. I'm sure people will join us uh, this afternoon. Um, but for now, let's make a start. Welcome to this King's Chambers webinar. Um, I'm Nigel Clayton. I'm a barrister and member of the Business and Property Group at King's. And I'm delighted to be joined with my friend and colleague, Dr. Nathan Smith, also barrister and member of the, the King's Property Group. Good afternoon, Nathan. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you, Nigel. Nice All to well? See you. Yeah, nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, we were just having a, a brief chat just before I start that um, we're still in this sort of twilight lockdown period where we've not actually been into chambers for a long time. I was last in in March last year. It's a strange period, isn't it? It is, although I think, um, I think people are getting more used to dealing with things remotely now. And um, yeah. my own experience is it's been working very well. But, um, yeah. But let's see how it goes. Right. Um, let's get on to business. Um, it's just a few months ago, I think, that Nathan and I spotted a particular case, um, CFL Finance and Laser Trust. And then we started to see all the sort of um, the kind of commentary and the fallout about the implications of it. Um, the CCA, the Consumer Credit Act implications of entering into Tomlin order schedules. And in fact, Nathan spotted another case as well, which is actually referred to um, in the CFL case, Holyoke and Candy, which raises some other consequential issues about the CCA applying to settlement agreements too. So we thought we'd put together this webinar, um, a little bit delayed getting it out to you, and I'm sorry for that, but um, just a couple of obvious things to, to bear in mind. I'm going to screen share in a second. Um, so I'll go straight to the PowerPoint slides. The slides will be emailed out to you, I think tomorrow after this presentation. I think the video can be available as well. So you'll have those documents. I think given the numbers of participants, um, we're probably not going to try and uh, juggle um, questions or comments on chat. Um, but I make the obvious point, if you have any queries at all, then by all means, please do contact us in Chambers in the normal way. Um, so let's try and make a start. I'll see if I can get onto screen share and then go straight onto the uh, presentation. So um, there's our introduction, the problem with Tomlins and the CCA. Um, by way of content, um, you'll see I'm going to cover the CFL Finance and Laser Trust case. Um, I'll talk about what he'd actually said because the facts are actually reasonably pertinent. And I'll talk about the CCA implications as well. Um, we'll come back onto video briefly, then we'll hand over to Nathan, who's going to look at Holyoke and Candy. And that's specifically in the context of challenging settlement agreements under the unfair relationship provisions. Uh, section 140a etc. So let's go straight on to the uh, the, the facts of uh, CFL finance and laser trust. As I say, the facts relatively important. Uh, CFL finance lends three and a half million uh, to L, a company uh, supported by a guarantee by L's director G. Uh, he's an individual. I emphasize the company and the individual status. That's quite important, as you'll see in a moment in the context of the application of the Consumer Credit Act. Uh, L defaulted uh, and CFL decided to sue G Direct, the guarantor. Uh, it's not clear from the transcript why they bypassed um, L itself, but they did. Uh, they sued G uh, for a money judgment and he raised all sorts of defenses. Uh, the claim was settled in the normal way by a Tomlin order, standard Tomlin proviso, all further proceedings to be stayed upon the terms set out in the schedule, safe of carrying those terms into effect. And then the schedule recited the terms of agreement. Um, essentially, it made provision for G to pay, I think, a, a compromise amount, £2 million by instalments. Uh, with some costs and then with default provisions for accruing interest uh, on top. Uh, he paid, I think, about, about 1.5 million, but then he defaulted on the rest. So what CFL did then was they served a statutory demand on him. It was actually for the colossal sum of 11 million by then with accrued interest. Uh, they then presented a bankruptcy petition. 
Uh, one of the issues raised by G uh, in defence of that um, application, that petition, was that the settlement agreement it entered into in the Tomlin uh, was unenforceable because it was a regulated credit agreement caught by the Consumer Credit Act. So the case proceeded before the chief ICC judge, the Insolvency and Companies Court judge. Uh, he gave judgment for CFL um, and he made the bankruptcy order. Uh, he held two things. First, um, the CCA didn't apply one, there's no provision of credit. And second, as a matter of policy, uh, a settlement agreement in a schedule to a Tomlin order isn't a credit agreement for the purpose of the CCA. So a policy decision there largely. Um, G, uh, one of his creditors, Laser Trust, who opposed the bankruptcy order then appealed. So it went on to the High Court before Mr. Justice Marcus Smith. Now he allowed the appeal on three grounds. He set aside the bankruptcy order, but he specifically rejected the appeal on the CCA grounds and he slightly differed uh, from the ICC judge. Uh, he agreed that the, um, on the particular facts there was no provision of credit, uh, but he disagreed that as a matter of principle, the CCA could not apply uh, to a settlement agreement in a schedule attached to a Tomlin order. Um, CFL appealed and G cross appealed, and I suspect this is where the case took a bit of a turn at this point, because uh, as matters turned out, uh, the bankruptcy petition was uh, struck out and the case only proceeded on G's cross appeal. So a little bit complicated, but the gist of it was uh, the only live issue was whether the Consumer Credit Act applied to a settlement agreement in the schedule to the Tomlin order. So it goes to the Court for Appeal now, and this is the neutral citation you've got, 2021 EWCA Civ earlier this year. Uh, the analysis of the Court for Appeal, fairly clinical really. Um, the CCA is capable of applying to a settlement agreement attached to a Tomlin order. Uh, and the analysis was fairly straightforward. They said the CCA bites on agreements, their contracts. Uh, the schedule to a Tomlin order involves an agreement. And therefore, if it involves a provision of credit, there's no reason why the CCA can't apply. So that's all pretty straightforward, simple analysis. Um, but then the real question was, did the settlement agreement itself provide credit? Um, and the section 91 CCA, of course, uh, credit includes a cash loan and quote, any other form of financial accommodation. Now, there was no cash loan in this case, of course, the loan had been made to the company. Uh, but was there a form of financial accommodation uh, in the terms of settlement? Well, again, if you look at the transcript of the judgment, this is where it does take a bit of a turn. It becomes remarkably complicated. But the short answer was yes, there was a form of financial accommodation. Uh, and the Court for Appeal carried out quite an exhaustive review of the meaning of credit uh, and the different forms that it can take. In particular, and again, this is where it gets a little complicated. At Court of Appeal held the essence of credit is debt deferment, uh, but debt deferment must take place pursuant to an agreement which requires consideration. So the issue then turned to whether there was adequate consideration. Uh, forbearance of a defense can constitute good consideration uh, giving up a bad defence, though, is not good consideration. So you can see where this is going. There then may then be an issue about where to draw the line, uh, whether it's good consideration or not. Um, and the court um, dodged that one. They didn't actually express a concluded view. But what they did find was that on the facts, there was a genuine, genuine tribal issue, whether the settlement agreement attached to the Tomlin order provided G with credit and hence was an enforceable for non-compliance with the various provisions of the CCA. Um, so they allowed his appeal, uh, G's appeal was allowed. Um, and I think what the decision therefore does is that it effectively leaves open the point that um, a settlement agreement in a Tomlin order that provides credit to an individual 
uh, may be caught by the CCA. I think that's the headline point to take from the case. Um, you've probably seen the case has been widely reported as sounding the alarm bells. Um, if you get the updates from Lexology, there was a flood of commentary about it. Um, fairly stark commentary, I've got to say, but no real solutions to the problem. I think one of the problems from my point of view with the Court of Appeal analysis is it largely dodged the policy arguments which the ICC judge had raised um, about whether the CCA should apply to a settlement agreement at all. Um, there are, as I said, pros and cons with that, but um, it seems to me that in terms of reviewing the policy, it probably requires a decision of the Supreme Court. Now, having checked this morning, there's no indication on West law that there's a pending appeal um, outstanding to the Supreme Court on this decision. And I suspect that may be unlikely um, because the bankruptcy petition uh, was already dismissed on other grounds. So there's probably no incentive for the parties to take this point any further and incur the costs. Um, but I think from my own perspective, let's just put this decision in context. Um, a consumer credit agreement is an agreement between an individual, that's the debtor, and another person, the creditor. Uh, the CCA issues, which the court did fairly helpfully note, if you want to just see what those are, what the Consumer Credit Act implications are, they're set out in the decision, they wouldn't have arisen on a loan from CFL uh, to C, that's the company, because of course the Consumer Credit Act doesn't apply to lending to a company, only an individual. So had the loan then been made by CFL to, to G, bear in mind he was a guarantor, but had the loan been made to him, I suspect it's likely that um, CFL would have been alert to the need for CCA compliance before lending. Um, so I suspect the issue in this case only actually became acute because CFL was enforcing payment from someone, that's the individual, G, uh, to whom it hadn't advanced the loan. So I emphasise that the circumstances are quite unusual and I suspect it actually cuts down uh, the likely impact of the CCA uh, in other cases. Um, I think the other point to note, the issues wouldn't have arisen, of course, uh, if the terms had been set out in a consent order. And again, the Court of Appeal made clear that the Consumer Credit Act uh, doesn't apply to a court order, it's paragraph 26. Um, so the issue in this case, of course, only arose because it was a, a compromise agreement attached to a, a Tomlin schedule. In other words, a separate contract. It wasn't itself a court order. I should just pause as well and just say it is immediately worth noting, as I've mentioned in the second bullet point here, um, the issues about CCA compliance. There is a, a point to bear in mind if you do rely upon the, uh, the CFL decision. As the law stood in 2011, that's when the Tomlin was entered into, a creditor required a license to carry on, quote, consumer credit business. Without it, a regulated agreement was not enforceable. But the point I make is that just bear in mind, those provisions were repealed with effect from 1st of April 14. So that's after uh, the critical date of the Tomlin order here. Uh, the Treasury transferred the regulatory aspects of consumer credit functions from the OFT to the FCA. Uh, authorization is now required under the Financial Service Markets Act, uh, unless, of course, it's exempt. So just bear in mind that slight difference with the, uh, the position as reported in, in the CFL case. But apart from that, the other provisions in the CCA, that's about the, the form and content of the regulated agreements, form of demands and notices and of course judicial control uh, still apply. So I guess uh, summary what to do next. Um, this is I suspect largely my own comment. Um, I think the starting point of course is if you are in this situation you're looking to, uh, to wrap up a settlement with a Tomlin uh, order uh, do check if there's any realistic prospect of the CCA actually applying to the particular settlement terms. And again, 
just bear in mind the risk, of course, is to the creditor. If you're the debtor, you probably won't care. Uh, you quite happily enter into these terms and uh, take what um, consequential benefits there may be. Um, can the risk be avoided altogether by simply entering into a, con a consent order? It seems to me that um, this has got to be the preferred option in most simple money cases. Uh, if there is a risk here, just enter into uh, a consent order for payment, which the court can make even by instalments, of course. Um, alternatively, I'm less attracted to this, uh, how feasible is it to obtain FSMA authorization and actually comply with the CCA requirements? Well, I put it in these notes, but I guess the answer to that is probably not, and certainly not at short notice. It's not a realistic option. Um, but I mentioned finally, um, cautiously, can the risk be minimized by some, quote, creative drafting? Um, I don't really advocate this, um, but I can imagine with some smart lawyers and some smart drafting, it may be thought possible to, by recitals or by appropriate agreements, to try and agree uh, that in whatever respect the CCA doesn't apply. Um, in other words, I suspect it's an attempt to try and raise an estoppel so the creditor can't take, uh, the debtor can't take the point afterwards. Um, you might also attempt to disguise uh, the provision of credit, bearing in mind it's the provision of credit uh, that triggered uh, the application of the CCA in the first place. So I mentioned creative drafting, possibly more to be alert to it rather than to have a go at it. But um, I think of all those options, as I say, uh, just weigh up carefully. Does the CCA actually apply? And so I think in most cases, probably not actually, but Otherwise, if it can't be avoided, if the risk can't be avoided, then as I say, the, the probably the simple answer is look to enter into a consent order. Now, I know that cuts down substantially uh, the scope for utilizing uh, Tomlin orders. I just put up one final slide. Um, that's the case of CFL Finance and Laser Trust. There was a mention um, in the CFL Finance case about the case of Holyoke and Candy. I mentioned it in a couple of contexts, but um, the specific context in which um, Nathan's going to deal with it is, of course, uh, the consequence for uh, unfair relationships. So I'll just stop my screen share there and uh, go back to Nathan and um, hand over to you, Nathan. Great. Thanks very much, Nigel. <clears throat> um, right, I'll try and start my slides up. Just bear with me a second while I uh, kept them going. Right, so hopefully everyone can now see uh, some slides on uh, Holyoke and Candy. This is actually an older case than the one Nigel was talking about um, from 2017, but it, 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 it has some fairly wide-reaching implications that I think are related to the case that Nigel was uh, talking about. Now, it's a, a fairly lengthy decision. Uh, it runs to about 193 pages, but uh, fortunately most of those um, aren't relevant for the talk today, and, and I'm not going to talk about all of the issues uh, in this case, uh, but I will just set out some uh, background facts. It's, uh, it, all of this started out of an arrangement or a, uh, an agreement to fund the purchase of a Grade 2 listed mansion block uh, in Belgravia, uh, Graven Garden House, which uh, if you're interested, you can probably find some pictures of uh, online, but they don't, uh, <laughs> don't all use up your bandwidth doing that. <laughs> right now uh, but it's, it's quite a nice uh, building and uh, it was bought by uh, Mark Holyoke in about July 2011 through a Jersey company with the assistance of uh, Nicholas Candy and Chris Candy uh, known as the Candy Brothers and uh, quite well-known uh, property developers uh, with the assistance of a loan for about 12 million pounds now that was arranged at uh, short notice and ultimately uh, the parties fell out um, Mr. Holliot brought a large number of claims, uh, largely in tort, uh, none of which succeeded. But the interesting point in this uh, case, it relates to a defence that the defendants put forward. And that was that uh, Mr. Holliot couldn't bring his claim because there was a settlement deed that was entered into in October 2013, uh, to which 
uh, the claimant said, well, actually, I'm, I can reopen this agreement using the Consumer Credit Act 1974. Now, which provisions were relied upon in this case? Well, this is all about the unfair relationship provisions. The, the case that Nigel talked about was uh, related to a regulated credit agreement. But the unfair relationship provisions are much wider than that, and they can catch, um, catch all sorts of uh, credit agreements. And I'll just give a quick recap of the provisions so, so, to, to try and explain uh, the, the, what was decided in this case. I mean, for those who are familiar with it, this will be pretty, pretty standard stuff, um, or if not, a, a, a short introduction. But um, the operation of these provisions comes out of sections 140A to C of the Consumer Credit Act. 140A deals with what amounts to unfairness. And uh, you can see from the points on the slide that uh, there's a fairly broad definition. It can be any of the terms of the agreement or of any related agreement. And I'll come back to what that means in this context. Uh, and the B is the way in which the credit has exercised or enforced uh, rights. And then it's any other thing done as if that wasn't broad enough uh, already. And then not only are the, is the ambit of the section wide, so are uh, the, the remedies that are available. And uh, they can include requiring creditors to repay uh, any sums that have been paid, uh, reducing sums that are payable, and indeed rewriting the terms of the uh, credit agreement. And, and so they're extremely wide ranging remedies, uh, quite wide in scope. And there's surprisingly little authoritative guidance on exactly how those powers should be exercised in a given case, other than perhaps a statement from uh, a Patel and Patel uh, decision that the remedy should uh, reflect and be proportionate to uh, the unfairness. So in, in a given case, as I say, the, the provisions are broad and there's not a great deal of guidance beyond those general uh, principles. So, how, uh, when it comes to applying them though, uh, there's usually a three-stage uh, process that um, you go through. The first is, of course, do they apply? If so, is the relationship unfair? And if, if it is, what, what order should be made? Now, the first uh, question, do the unfair relationship provisions apply? Because they are so wide in operation, it is important to be aware of the exclusions that there are. Uh, the first uh, is that they only apply to individual borrowers, but that does extend to partnerships and unincorporated bodies. And the second important exemption is uh, found in Article 60 C2 of the Regulated Activities Order. And the main relevance of that uh, for most cases is at the exclusion of residential mortgage lending from uh, the operation. In addition, I think the, to, to the bounce back loan scheme but if uh, you do come across a, a settlement agreement or, uh, well, a settlement agreement um, that's related to the provision of credit in some way, and it is with an individual and not exempt, and um, then some other questions to ask. And the first is, is the settlement agreement itself a credit agreement within the scope of uh, the Act? And as I said, it doesn't need to be a regulated uh, agreement. And then there's a, a further question, even if it's not, is the settlement agreement a related agreement? And uh, I, I'm also going to touch on the, uh, the issue of policy considerations because that was something that was discussed too in uh, Holyoke and Candy. So looking at those issues, was the settlement deed in Holyoke a credit agreement? Well, it was between an individual and a creditor. It wasn't exempt. And so once again, the question was, did it provide credit? And as Nigel said, it's not just the question of whether or not there's a cash loan involved. It can be any other form of uh, financial accommodation too. And uh, in this case, it, it turned out that the, the settlement agreement was uh, a, a credit agreement. And that was because one of the provisions of uh, the deed was a clause uh, by which the parties had agreed to release to each other signed counterparts of a loan extension. So, uh, and that uh, extension itself provided for about a year's worth of debt uh, deferment. But uh, because effectively that was released on the entry into the settlement agreement, 
it was held that uh, the uh, the settlement deed itself uh, extended the provision of credit uh, and financial accommodation. That was sufficient. But even if it hadn't been, there was the question of whether or not it would have been a related agreement. Now, what is a related agreement? Well, the, the definitions in section 140C uh, 4, uh, there are several parts to it, but the main one that's normally engaged when looking at settlement um, issues is uh, subparagraph B. Uh, because it, it's sometimes argued that settlement agreements in respect to the credit agreement are linked transactions to uh, the main agreement. And th that uh, term, linked transaction, has another definition in section 19 of the uh, Act. And uh, I'm not going to go through all of the sub paragraphs because there probably isn't enough time um, this afternoon. But uh, one of those uh, sub paragraphs, one of those subcategories, is a transaction initiated by the creditor uh, for another purpose related to uh, the principal agreement. And uh, as the judge in Holyoke said, that rather torturous definition uh, seemed to him to be satisfied in, in this case because. Uh, the settlement deed was entered uh, into by the parties. It was initiated by the creditor and entered into for a purpose related to the principal agreement, namely to obtain uh, agreement to the supplemental extension agreement, uh, which itself is a credit agreement, and therefore the deed was a linked transaction. Now, it's clear on the facts how that works in Holyoke and Candy, but it, I think it's probably less clear how it applies more generally because uh, linked transactions, the other examples, it's not obvious from the short extract I've given you, but the other definitions all are generally things that happen at the time the main agreement is entered into, and they're linked to it at that point in time. So arguably there's some ambiguity in uh, the other purpose um, definition and whether or not it can in fact apply uh, at a much later point in time. But uh, at least where uh, it, it also involves the provision of credit, Holyoke would seem to be authority for the proposition that, um, that, that it does. So this was a settlement agreement then that not only became a credit agreement, but it was also a related agreement. And so the argument was raised, should this, this type of agreement be uh, considered under the unfair relationship provisions uh, or not? or should it be excluded for policy reasons? And one reason that was suggested uh, that it should be excluded for is because, um, it, or the argument went that if a bona fide compromise of consumer credit act claims could be unpicked using these provisions, it would really never be possible to settle uh, this type of claim. And that can't have been the, the, the intention of uh, parliament when drafting these uh, provisions. But the judge rejected that argument and held that there was an obvious danger in holding any agreement settling Consumer Credit Act claims is effective to oust the court's powers because it would run the risk of driving a proverbial coach and horses through the protection afforded by the Act. And so he held that uh, the fact that there was a settlement agreement wasn't sufficient to oust the jurisdiction of the court. But then on the other hand, he offered uh, some comfort in that uh, that doesn't mean the agreement is to be treated as though it doesn't exist. And the policy considerations, uh, that is the policy of the court to encourage good faith settlements uh, uh, and to enforce compromises when they're made, uh, continue to apply. So we left in a slightly uneasy perhaps situation whereby when uh, these provisions are engaged, a great deal of weight is sometimes given to the settlement deed, but or agreement but that doesn't exclude the operation of uh, the provisions. And so it's well worth bearing in mind then what are examples of unfair conduct, because uh, these could be relied upon to try and reopen a qualifying agreement. And there's, there's a very good list actually in uh, Holyoke itself of the types of unfairness that, uh, that, that apply under the different um, parts of section 148. And uh, it's actually derived from several authorities, but, but it's a good place to look at if you want an example of, of, of things that might be unfair. And in relation to the terms themselves, 
Uh, the question, one, one issue is whether the terms are commonplace or, or, uh, or for the nature of the product that's being supplied. Uh, and another is whether there are sound commercial reasons uh, for including the term. Uh, another is whether it represents the legitimate and proportionate attempt uh, by the creditor to protect its position. And then uh, obviously consideration of the extent to which the terms for the benefit of uh, to the benefit of the creditor to the at the expense of the of the debtor. All of these things are relevant, relevant as is the strength of the parties at bargaining positions. But I, I think one principle that probably comes out of this um, for this authority is that the scale of the lending and uh, whether it's commercial or quasi-commercial is uh, it is very relevant because of course much likely to be slower to find unfairness in high value lending arrangements uh, between commercial parties than in credit agreements affecting consumers. Other examples of unfairness, there are obviously pressure or whether, they, uh, whether the creditor knew the borrower didn't understand what was uh, going on. And then after the formation, uh, thinking now about uh, subparagraph C of 148, uh, what about what about unfairness at that point in time? Well, you might again look to see whether any pressure has been uh, applied, whether any demand was prompted by improper motives or arbitrary decisions, the extent to which the creditor has shown uh, patience before leaping to enforcement, and uh, and indeed whether the debtor has uh, raised unfounded claims in response. And, and perhaps that last point is worth bearing in mind too, because it's often the analysis in these cases sometimes focuses on the creditor, but in fact, it's the unfairness of the entire situation that has to be considered. And, and so the conduct of the debtor is, uh, I think at least, equally uh, relevant in many of these uh, cases. But if that's uh, causing uh, concern, then of course, you, you can't even be confident, well, you, <laughs> there's, there's, there's even a concern, I suppose, that even when a creditor complies with all its regulatory obligations, that doesn't necessarily mean that the agreement isn't unfair, depending on the facts. And uh, the, the, the Supreme Court decision in Plevin is, is really the authority for that, that proposition. So what is the relevance of a uh, settlement agreement? Well, the judge, uh, I suppose, gave some comfort and he said that it seems to him highly relevant that the parties have reached a compromise uh, that there was a genuine dispute, uh, a fair arguable case on both sides, and the terms of the compromise weren't uh, colourable. That's to say, where, where they look fair and reasonable, courts generally won't get too involved in a detailed analysis of what exactly what's been traded off uh, against what. And, and, and that leads to the quote at the bottom of that slide, which says the court to look at the matter broadly to see if a bona fide compromise has been reached on legal advice, and if it has, uh, be very slow uh, to go around it. So, and I think it's also worth pointing out that Holyoke was a case uh, where, in fact, the settlement agreement wasn't uh, reopened under these uh, provisions too. But the particular matters relied upon uh, were fairly broad because they can be. And uh, there were five specific matters, uh, threats and intimidation, uh, an acceleration clause, extension fees, uh, a double interest charge, and some requirement to market and sell the property. Uh, two to five of those all arose from terms of the agreement. And as I said, the court looked at the, the issues fairly broadly and on the basis that it was a case with high value lending, uh, commercial parties, uh, involved and uh, solicitors and legal advisors involved in the settlement and decided in broad terms that it shouldn't uh, start unpicking uh, that, that agreement. But the first issue, of course, is a question of just more of fact, but um, that was not found to be established either. And ultimately, the agreement was found to be fair. So when the court came to think about the third remedy, sorry, the third issue, whether a further remedy was required, the answer was uh, no. But um, I think it's fair to say that this case raises some fairly, uh, has some fairly broad implications um, where there's a settlement related to uh, a credit agreement. 
And it's important to have a think about at least whether the unfair relationship provisions apply to that type of uh, settlement. And if they do, or there's a risk that they do, and uh, you're uh, acting for uh, a creditor, to think about the extent to which a creditor would be able to show that the relationship is fair if it came to be challenged, or that the settlement was fair, at least in broad terms, because of the onus under the under the Act is, of course, on the creditor to uh, is, establish that. And I just make a couple of general points insofar as they can be made in respect to these uh, provisions. It will be easier to show fairness where legal advice has been obtained uh, it, as part of the as part of the compromise. And it will also be easier in general to uh, to establish where you have a commercially experienced borrower and uh, there's significant lending involved. But uh, when those uh, conditions aren't satisfied and, and, and the agreement uh, potentially qualifies, it's certainly something to think about as to, uh, as, as, as to the extent to which the, the broad look of the compromise is fair uh, or not. So uh, that concludes my part of the talk, I'll just turn off uh, this screen share, hopefully without stopping the whole <laughs> webinar. And um, as I said, I think those two cases, the, the one that St. Nigel spoke about and the one that I uh, talked about, uh, just show how the uh, Consumer Credit Act can have some uh, perhaps unanticipated consequences for uh, settlement agreements. And, um, and, and why it's always important, I think, when you have any provision of credit, to just think about and bear in mind whether or not there could be uh, some, some provision, uh, the unfair relationship provisions, or, 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 or in the case that Nigel talked about in, in Tom Hill, was whether there is scope for that agreement to be unpicked as a later, as a later date. Thank you. Interesting, I'm just picking up on your case, um... Nathan, I, I suspect, um, just thinking off the top of my head, I suspect the scope to challenge uh, an arm's length settlement agreement under the unfair relationship provisions is probably quite limited in practice. But um, and I deal with unfair relationship issues in the mortgage context reasonably frequently, and they're, they're often sort of thrown into the mix by disgruntled borrowers who have no other defence or no other line of attack. And I mean, my experience is that the courts generally don't like these unparticularized complaints of unfair relationship. And I think most don't succeed. I think where they do succeed is where there are particular targeted complaints about particular features of the transaction. Now, it might be any, anything from, say, rates of interest, particular charges or particular conduct. But... I think under unfair relationship, it's always a wise thing to try and focus on you know, particular forms of attack rather than bombarding the court with general complaints. So interesting. Um, two quite technical cases there. Um, no getting away from that. They're quite difficult to talk about. I have spotted a few comments on chat and a few questions as well. As I said, I'm not inclined to try and tackle those just now, but uh, Apologies for that. In the normal way, if you have any queries at all, um, by all means, contact us in chambers. We're happy to discuss things informally. Um, I'm N Clayton at kingschambers.com. Nathan's N Smith at kingschambers.com. Uh, or do try and contact our clerks. Um, just finally, I suspect, Nathan, it's probably about time you and I did our mortgage law update uh, webinars soon. So... <laughs> We'll have to put our minds to those and uh, details will be circulated on the resources page um, on the King's Chambers website. But uh, for now, for this afternoon, thanks everyone for joining us. Just a reminder, you will get the slides uh, sent out to you automatically, but uh, thanks very much indeed and enjoy what's left of your day. Cheerio.